If you have questions about health, nutrition, prescription drugs, if you want to wean yourself off your meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we are here for you, 844-236-6010. If you have comment or success stories or you just want to contribute to the conversation, 844-236-6010 is our number on the bright side. Longevity products can be purchased off of brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. And you can also click on the Join the Team link if you want to start a longevity business for a one-time $30 fee. You can be a part of the Longevity family. Sign up to join the Brightside Ben team. Start a longevity business. Work out of your home. Be your own boss. Make as much or as little money as you care to make. Helping spread the word about the power and importance of a good nutritional supplement program. Click on the Join the Team link at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. And if you want to purchase our Truth Skin Health products, go to truthtreatments.com. I'm not even going to tell you about them. I've been talking about them now for years. Just go to truthreviewed.com. Check out our over 500, now close to 600, five-star reviews, truthreviewed.com. And you can purchase our Truth Skin Health products at truthtreatments.com. We have an interesting guest coming up at the bottom of the hour. Sparrow Hart is the founder of Circles and Air, Circles of Air and Stone, and he's going to talk to us about safety and why safety isn't all that. Everybody wants a safe life. Everybody wants to be safe. That's the primal imperative of the human being. But there's something higher than safety, and we're going to talk about that with Sparrow Hart. There are, those of, uh, there are those who would take advantage of the human drive for safety, the human desire to be safe for their own ends, and uh, I would present that we may be experiencing that manipulation as we speak. I, got a, I, was reading a, I didn't get to read this yet, but I printed off an interesting article I plan on reading. A headline, The Economy is, cra- is Cratering. Welcome to the Trump Depression. Americans' economy is like a patient who's bleeding out while doctors bicker over band-aids. This is the kind of fear-mongering that we are immersed in, that we're saturated in by some who are well-meaning and others who are not so well-meaning. If you watch the news and you feel crappy after you watch the news, don't watch the news. And I'm telling you, I know what's going on and I still feel crappy after I watch the news. I force myself to watch it with, uh, with, a, with my BS filter on. By the way, tomorrow we're going to be talking to a, a really cool guy who came up with a, invented a game called Propaganda where he teaches people to critical think. And that's really what we're dealing with here, folks, is an inability to critically think. En masse, not uh, present company excluded, perhaps. But as, as a culture and as a society, we are dealing with an inability to critically think. This inability to critically think for, uh, compels us or induces us to buy into what we're told. And if we're told, uh, if we're told uh, that the world is coming apart, that the sky has fallen, we're going to go into fear. What we really got to do is we got to learn to be internally motivated. What we really have to do is learn to trust ourselves. What we really have to do is learn to become our own authority. We want to learn how to become joyful from the inside. We want to uh, learn to become healthy from the inside. And we want to learn to become informed from the inside. Intuition. We want to gain our information about reality, at least largely, from how we perceive it intuitively. We want to trust our intuition. We want to learn to take care of our, uh, our health by trusting our bodies, by learning how to use nutrition, by learning how to use dietary strategies, by learning how to exercise. We want to learn to find our joy from inside. If we're trying to find our joy or our pleasure or our bliss from the outside, we're going to be at the mercy of whatever winds happen to be blowing. We want to learn to become internally motivated in terms of our joy and our bliss, in terms of our health and our happiness, and in terms of how we get information, how we're informed We get informed largely through something called media. Media is something that's in the middle. It comes from the same root word as medicine. We get our health from medicine. We get our health and we get our information, and ultimately we get our peace of mind from the outside, from mediators. This is what the media is about. The media says, don't worry about understanding reality on your own. We'll tell you about it. This is what the government says. Don't worry about how the world is. We'll tell you about it. Don't worry about being safe on your own. We'll keep you safe. Everybody wants to keep us safe, and everybody wants to keep us happy, and everybody wants to keep us healthy. Everybody wants to keep us informed, and we're less informed and less happy and less healthy than ever before because we're trusting media. We're trusting middlemen. The media is a middleman. Doctors are middlemen. The government is a middleman to provide us with security, to provide us with health, to provide us with information. 
Learn to become internal. You know, there's, there's the concept that, that uh, the Cree Indian had called Watiko. Watiko, W-E-T-I-K-O, is uh, generally speaking, you think of it as, as a, a mind virus that keeps you, that keeps you uh, entranced in a reality that is created for us, a consensus reality that's crafted for us that doesn't serve us. And the only way to protect ourselves from a TICO, which is the same way to protect ourselves from viruses, is to learn to become immune on our own, to develop our immunity. As it turns out, stress is one of the best ways to build immunity. It's called hormesis in biology, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S. -E Reading from the International Journal of Molecular Sciences, hormesis and defense of infectious disease. Infectious disease... Global health burden remain associated with high social impact. Treatment of affected patients relies on antimicrobial agents. In this article, we will discuss evidence that by applying the concept of hormesis, that is intentional stress, we can develop a defense mechanism that decreases the extent of infection-associated tissue damage without directly targeting, without directly targeting targeting pathogenic microorganisms. This idea of targeting pathogenic microorganisms, this idea of, of attacking the outside invader comes from germ theory. Louis Pasteur, who said that everything is caused by germs. This is when, we've, this is when science officially, you know, we've always been looking to the outside for diseases. They used to think it was, it was evil winds or, or something from, um, from angels or little elves that shot dwarves that, or little dwarves that shot arrows at you. Today we have germs from the outside. Past, Louis Pasteur gave us germ theory, and now we are all obsessed with killing microorganisms or protecting ourselves from them by wearing masks and by staying inside the house. Well, guess what, folks? Through stress, through hormesis, through infection, we get stronger. That's called immunity. But we don't allow that to occur because we're scared and because we're taught to be scared. I cannot wait to talk to our guest on Monday um, who's going to tell us why it's absolutely a must to stay in the house. Why it's absolutely a must. He says you only want to go out of the house when you're... Uh, when you're for food and then you come back in the house. He doesn't say run back in the house, but, but basically that's his idea. We're going to talk to him on Monday. And this is, he, you know, he's not, a, he's not specifically uh, uniquely ridiculous. This is just the general idea. We don't give our body a chance to develop uh, immunity. We don't understand hormesis. We don't understand the nature of stress. We don't understand the nature of our, our, our inside ability, our built-in ability to handle whatever life happens to deal us. All right, I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll be back on the bright side right after this. We're back on the bright side, 844-236-6010 is our number, 844-236-6010. If you have questions about health, nutrition, prescription drugs, if you want to wean yourself off your meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we can help you do that. And uh, let's see here. I'm not sure if we have any calls. can't get my computer to work. We've got Spare a Heart coming up at the bottom of the hour. We're going to talk about mythology, and we're going to talk about why you don't necessarily want to be too safe if you want to have a healthy, happy life. In biology, we call that idea hormesis. Hormesis says stress is your friend. Good stress. You stress. E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. -S. You stress is associated with longevity. I talked to a gal, a, uh, a, a workout gal. She, has, she does Pilates, and uh, she's really proud of being in great shape. And she called me up about her skin, and she sent me a picture of her skin. I looked at her skin. I could tell a lot by looking at people's skin. I've been doing this a long time, and I could tell by, a lot by looking at people's skin in pictures. And I could tell right away she was dealing with uh, rashy, uh, or rashy appearance, oily skin. She was actually complaining about a condition called perioral dermatitis. Perioral dermatitis is when you have, um, you have uh, pimples or blemishes around your mouth. Perioral means around the mouth. Dermatitis is a rash. It's kind of like a rashy appearance around the mouth. In my experience in the last uh, working with skin for three plus decades, that's a condition that involves the digestive system, specifically the stomach, although also the intestines, stomach acid, uh, um, replacing stomach acid, usually a condition called hypochlorhydria, 
Low stomach acid is associated with perioral dermatitis. But I could tell there was some food problems. So I started talking to her, and she says to me, well, I eat every two hours. First, I said to her she should fast. So she should, uh, so you can, uh, she'd be able to tell if there's any food problems. You always want to fast before you're assessing your digestive issues. That way, if you have a food problem, it becomes more clear. It becomes more, more visible to you. If you fast for a couple days, she says, no, I never fasted. I said, not even for one day. She says, oh, I, I eat every two hours, she tells me. And she's an, exer- she's an exercise specialist, a, a Pilates instructor. I'm in the best shape of my life, she tells me. I said, well, I didn't tell her this, but I'm thinking, if you're in the best shape of your life, what's with your perioral dermatitis and what's with your rash? Well, she meant she's in the best physical shape of her life because she's got muscles and she's got a, her, her musculoskeletal system is well, well developed. That's not how you assess how healthy you are. If you have perioral dermatitis, if you've got blemishes around your mouth and a rash around your mouth, you're not healthy. I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm just saying that's just the facts. Plus, I could see other things on her skin. So she says, then she just, she's going to, uh, I said, well, fasting's really helpful. She says, then she does something and says something to me that I'm sure she said a million times to people. And they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. She says, well, let me ask you something. Could you put... If you have your car, could you go very far if you didn't have gas in your car? That's supposed to be a reason why you want to eat every every two hours. Well, that's absolutely nonsensical. And I told her that kindly and gently. I said that your body's not a car. Your body uh, has a mechanism for fueling itself when you don't eat. It's called ketogenesis. She says, whoa, yeah, I didn't know about that. So you ever hear of the ketogenic diet? Well, yeah, I heard of the ketogenic diet. Would well, you know what it is or how it works? No, no idea. Well, it turns out the ketones are produced under conditions of starvation. So you say, what? How could that possibly be? Well, the body's designed to handle starvation. Uh, not complete starvation, but an hour, a, a day of starvation, or two days of starvation, or three days, or even four days of starvation. The body can handle it. And how does it handle it? By upregulating metabolism, by producing energy more efficiently. This is what hormesis is about. Under conditions of duress, we become more efficient. But if we don't allow the duress to kick in for a day or two or three, we don't get to leverage the power of these adaptive mechanisms. And that's what's going on in the world today because we don't want to deal with a, a, a viral infection if because we're so terrified of getting infected We're willing to do all kinds of things and jump through all kinds of hoops and lose all of our freedoms so that we don't get to interact with this so-called microbe, with this bad guy, if you will, not understanding that by the very interaction, we become stronger, we become better, we become more efficient at life. And the powers that be, well-meaning or perhaps not, don't want us to know that. Anytime you hear an emergency room doctor Uh, And I'm not ripping on doctors, but there's a lot of ER doctors and there's a lot of ICU doctors and nurses and medical professionals who just want to save us, who just want to protect us. Well, don't save us. Don't protect us. Let us take care of it ourselves. Let us let our immune systems take care of it ourselves. Let us have some stressors in our life, whether it's infectious stressors through microbes or whether it's psychological stressors or whether it's economic stressors so we can become better. That's how the system works. All right, 844 is our number. Let's go to my friend Bob. I'm glad you called back, Bob. Hey, Ben, how are you? Hey, DNA, man. Do you want to talk yep. about DNA? I remember uh, yesterday we talked about that. I, the DNA is so unbelievably fascinating, mysterious, and just one of the most incredible testimonies to the, the unfathomable, unfathomable mystery that we call life. And by the way, viruses, as you know, are DNA. What, what's with your phone, Bob? Bob, Bob, Why? Bob. Is, there a, is there a problem? Yeah. Do you hear me? That, yeah, there's some kind of me? weird glitch. Yeah, go, yeah, we just got a bad connection. Yeah. I think we all, this happens a lot, Bob. But go ahead, tell me what your point, what you were going you were gonna to say, and then maybe yeah. we, can, we can deal with it. Okay, well, I think, uh, I personally believe that uh, the, the DNA kind of speaks to uh, um, intelligent design. Yeah, and not just a random, not just a random order. You, uh, but, you mean the nucleotides didn't just get together on their own? Exactly. Okay. Um, I, I, I say it, uh, uh, I have a hunch you're right, but let me ask you this: This is the problem I have with intelligent design. Intelligent design. I so I assume you mean an intelligent designer, correct? Correct. Okay. So who designed the intelligent designer? Well, that's just a matter of faith. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. There's nothing, I'm good. There's no way as long as you're one. honest about it, as long as you're honest about it, that's good. So, so why do we have to posit a designer? Why don't we just have faith that it, it just got put together? Why do we have to, why do we have, to have, faith, have faith in a designer? Why can't we have a faith in random? Oh, if it's just well, faith. If it's just faith and it's not based on anything, it's just we believe it, why do we have to believe a designer? Why don't we just believe it got together randomly? Well, I, I just get back to the fact that it's actual code. It's, uh, you know, no, answer the question. Don't dance around it, Bob. You're too smart to, da- <laughs> You're too smart to dance around it. Now. So if you have faith in an intelligent designer and you admit very, very nobly, I must say, that uh, it's faith, why don't you have faith in random? How did you pick a designer to have faith in not random? Yeah, I'm going to let you know. Energy. Po- I mean, it's, ener- it's energy. I mean, what I see of it, you know, is that when we pass away, I think your circuits are frying on that one, Bob, between me and you and and whoever's listening. I think your circuits are frying. Because it's a good question, right? Right, right, right. Why do you happen to have faith in a designer? Why don't we just have faith that it all got together randomly in a bunch of clay? I don't know the answer to that. And that's, I think, the key right there. The best answer is I don't know. That's the best answer. Or if you want to have faith in a designer, you say it just makes me feel better. Because sometimes we can, to personalize things, to personify things, to anthropomorphize things, makes us, it makes it easier to relate to. And I think that's what God is. God is us, us having a person, uh, anthropomorphization of nature so that we can relate to it. And that's what the myth of Jesus is. It's the son. That's why it says you can only get to the father through the son. You can only see this great mystery through something tangible. Because our mind has to have something tangible. Does that make sense? Our mind has to have something to relate to. And and that's the whole idea of that. And I didn't want to get too much into theology because I love talking about the electromagnetic properties of DNA. Are you familiar with DNA computers? The concept of DNA. I'll have to call you back because I have two unrelated questions over and above this. Okay, so we'll we'll talk when we come back. Thanks so much. I I love speaking to you, Bob. You always got something interesting to say. You always always, always make me think. All right. Uh, We got Sparrow Heart coming up in our next segment. We're going to talk about why you don't want to be too safe and how uh, understanding myth can help us deal with what's going on. on the bright side. I am Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for joining us. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific at 10 to 11 Central Time, 24-7 on our archive page at brightsideben.com and benfuchsarchives.com. Also have lots of good news stories and blog posts and videos and lots of health information at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, and criticalhealthnews.com. And don't forget to take a look at our Truth Skin Health products, all formulated in my compounding pharmacy for healing the skin. Healing is beauty, and that's why we have over 500, going on 600 five-star reviews, all up at truthreviewed.com, and you can purchase our products at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. Okay, I am looking forward to speaking to our next guest. Sparrow Hart is a uh, Vision Quest guide, I suppose you'd say. Uh, His website is questforvision.com, and he's got a very interesting perspective that we can all relate to And on this program. At least I can relate to it, and I hope you can relate to it, and that's the idea that being, uh, being too safe might actually be dangerous. I can't wait to talk to Sparrow Hart, author of Letters to the River, A Guide to a Dream Worth Living. Please welcome to the bright side, Sparrow Hart. Hello, Sparrow. Hey, good morning, Ben. Good How are you? you? I'm, I'm very well, and it's good to talk to you. And uh, this morning we were discussing a concept called hormesis. Have you ever heard that term, hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S? It's a biological No, term. I haven't. What's hormesis? Me- hormesis means that when a system is under stress, the biological system is stressed out, it gets better. Starvation, mm-hmm. fasting, exercise, these are all examples of hormesis. Trimming a leaf ba- uh, trimming, trimming your leaves back on a bush to make them bushier is an example of hormesis. Treating the skin with exfoliating agents, these are all examples of hormesis. And in a way, we're do- having a sort of psychological version of that with what's going on today. And that's why your, uh, your, your blurb on RTIR was so interesting to me. Why, a safe life is, uh, is da- why too safe a life is dangerous. So I want to talk to you about vision quests. I want to talk to you about letters to the river. But before we get going, in a nutshell, why is live, why is it seems contradictory, right? Safety should be good. Why is too safe a life dangerous? Well, I think because uh, people people basically are not fragile. Uh, people are we're a system that's anti fragile, and it's very mm. much like what you what you call with hormesis. You know, mm-hmm. muscles get stronger when you mm-hmm. stress. You know, when you lift weights and you stress them, they yeah. actually respond and get stronger. You're you immune- said something. You, you said system. something. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, your immune system gets strong.
younger, the more microbes you're exposed to. And it's yeah. kind of a way children these days have so many allergies because they don't play outside. They don't get exposed. And so they have very weak immune systems because immune systems develop like muscles do or like yeah. like problem solving does. The, the more stresses or challenges we're exposed to, the, the better we grow. So. so what do you think when you watch the news and you hear these emergency room doctors saying you have to wear a mask and everybody's got to be staying inside and we're locking things down and we're shutting down businesses and putting people in jail if they don't quarantine? What do you think in your head, knowing what you know about this idea of the importance of stress, or as they say, you stress, E-U-S-T-R-R-E-S-S, what goes to your head when you watch this, when you, when you see that and you hear that in the, in the world? Well, I don't have just... I don't have just one response. I certainly feel like, gosh, sure, if you're working in an emergency room, who knows what's walking through the door? And um, and so I, I can certainly understand it in an emergency room situation. But um, generally, most people, myself, I assume you and many other people, don't live in an emergency room. <laughs> we mm-hmm. actually... We actually live a life, and and virtually everything we do has risk. It has some risk, and um, and so generally, I think to to me, there's always a. I will I will do simple and easy things. Sure, I'll wash my hands when I have to go to a store. I mean, it's all mandated now. I'll wear a mask, and it doesn't bother me. But I'm not going to wear a mask outside. I'm not going to try and exercise or go on a bike ride with a mask on. I think that's that's basically overprotection, and in in some sense, it's uh, one. It's not good for us. I don't think it's even that good for us physically. But I also think psychologically, living in fear is not a way to live. Okay, you said something really, really interesting, uh, and there's a really cool book called Anti-Fragile. Tell us a little bit about what that means and what an anti-fragile system is. Have you heard of the book, by the way, Anti-Fragile, by a, I forgot the guy's name, uh, Nassim uh, something. Yeah, uh, something like, is it yeah. something like Nassim? Uh, yeah, Nassim Taleb or something. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's a really yeah, cool I book. And, of, yeah, so both. tell us about that. Okay, so we could say there's three basic states we could describe fragile resilient and anti-fragile. Now, fragile is something like, oh, yeah, if you've got a 95-year-old grandmother with respiratory problems, she's fragile. <laughs> you know, most right. most any stress could easily kill her. She's fragile. Uh, like a tea, uh, antique tea, tea cup is fragile. Mm-hmm. Now, and then there's things that are resilient. A rubber ball is resilient. It, you know, you drop it, it doesn't break like that teacup. So so there are systems that are resilient. But anti-fragile refers to systems and beings that actually, when they are stressed or exposed to difficulties, they actually grow stronger. So, um, you know, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, studies about that. But basically, human beings are at their core anti-fragile. Love it. And human systems, biological systems. The heart is anti-fragile. The liver is anti-fragile. The lungs are anti-fragile. The circulatory yeah. system is anti-fragile. You know, yeah. the muscle. You know, all, the body in general is anti-fragile. And I think that we don't really get taught that. We think of we we only think there's either fragile or or not fragile. You call it resilient. We think of those yeah. only those two. But this idea of hormesis and eustress and and uh, anti-fragility, it's something that we can take advantage of if we understand it. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And did you ever hear, did you hear of that uh, al- uh, allergy to peanuts study that was done in the early 2000s? Where they gave them a little bit of, of, of allergy and they got stronger? I, I'm guessing. I, I oh, oh, well, yeah. Well, in, in the 1990s was the first time, oh, peanut allergies kind of hit the press. And then all sorts of parents were not giving their kids peanuts. But they, so they gave it, they did a study. They had 600 babies. They did, divided them into 300 each. And one set of parents was told to give their kids some form of peanut butter three times a week. And the other set of parents was told to actually not expose their kids to peanut butter. Five years later, the kids that had exposed to peanut butter, 3% of them had very mild allergies to peanuts. But the rest of them? The group that wasn't exposed to peanuts, almost 20% had severe allergies to peanuts. Yeah. 
So introducing a stressor into the system allow, taught the system or encouraged or somehow induced the system to become stronger and more and, and better at able to handle the stressor. Had yeah. to be introduced to the stressor. So do yeah, you have yeah. kids by, do, do you have kids, Sparrow? Yeah, I have one daughter. How did you raise her? Did you raise her with this idea of being able to leverage anti-fragility, not to be scared of, of things that were potentially dangerous? Yeah, and I can tell you one story that kind of <laughs> illustrates that well. When my daughter was three or four, out in the backyard, we had an enormous uh, birch tree, one of the biggest birch trees around, and she was three or four, and they had this huge limb that came out about four feet up, and she wanted me to boost her up on it. So I, I boosted her up. Sparrow, we got we got to take a break. I want to hear okay. a story, and we'll come back from commercial. We'll talk to we'll uh, talk about that. I also want to talk to you about Vision Quest as well. Sparrow Hart, his website is questforvision.com. We'll be back with more Sparrow on the Bright Side right after this. On the bright side, I'm Pharmacist Ben. We're talking to Sparrow Hart. His website is questforvision.com. Sparrow, when we were discussing hormesis and anti-fragile systems, I immediately, my mind immediately went to how we raise children. That's why I asked you if you had any kids, and then you were telling us a story. Continue, and then we'll talk about uh, uh, vision quests. Uh, oh, so, the so here we are. My daughter, her name's Prairie. She's between three and four, and I've boosted her up to this low level on the tree, and she starts climbing up this little kid. And, of course, pretty soon she's up, oh, maybe 12, 14 feet. And, of course, she's – and I'm standing under her, you know, craning, making sure I'm directly under her in case she doesn't fall. And at some point – and my neck is getting sore from staring up. And at some point I, uh, I just say to her, Prairie, would you do me a favor? And she says, what? And I said, please don't go any higher. And she says, why? At that point, most any parent I know would say, because it's dangerous. But that's because not I said what I, so. Yeah, that's what I told her, because I had made a commitment never to lie to her. And so my, and she said, why? And I said, because I'm getting scared. Uh-huh. And, and then she said, why? And I said, because I, had, I told her I had this commitment to protect her and her safety, and I was doing that, and it was making me nervous, her being up there. And she just, at some point, she just stopped, thought a bit about it for, you know, 20 seconds, and then said, okay. But it's like, I did not make the world scary for her. I didn't say because it's dangerous. And I think as parents, we do that all the time. We lie to her. Uh... We lie to them, say, oh, don't do this. It's dangerous. Don't, and, and it makes them scared of the world. But in yeah. fact, we're just not wanting to deal with our own fears. <laughs> that's, so, a, that's great. That's great. Because no, there's hardly any parents would, that would ever say that it's about me. It's about, yeah. it, we always say it's about you. We're, we're worried for you. We don't want you to hurt yourself. We don't realize that we're just, we're just dealing with our own issues or not dealing with our own issues around fear and around danger. Yeah, That's it has all sorts of other benefits, too, as well as not making her scared of the world. Yeah. We started yeah. really early on for her, her to become aware of, oh, other people have needs, too, and they're going to mm. express. Other people have needs, and I said, you don't have to respond to them, but starting early on, we developed a relationship where each of us had needs, and I had to obviously explain it in a at one point in a three- or four-year-old way, but... Um, and so, yeah, we never got into any kind of really big conflicts around that because it wasn't a power game where I say, oh, it's dangerous. Uh-huh. And then, uh-huh. That's and you're a savior. And you're here to and save her. Yeah, when they're, when they're 12 or something, they say, it's not dangerous, and I like doing it. And then all of a sudden yeah. you're in a power struggle. <laughs> yeah. So how did this kind of upbringing, how did she turn out with this kind of upbringing? What was her relationship to fear and to danger and to safety? had this oh, this idea of if there's something she wants to do she if she's I'm in, in, she never worries about failure and she just mm. says I'm going to give it my best shot and she and she says I'm going to give it my best shot and if it doesn't work out I can live with that but I'm not going to avoid taking my best shot cuz I'm afraid it might not work out so she's just she's really curious and willing to Take a risk, risks in life, risks of getting rejected, risks of turned down. That's, and 
That's that's a great job. That's a that, that's a that's the the parents. I think the, the number one goal of a parent is to have a kid who does have an attitude like that, and who is not running from everything and scared of their own shadow. And we have a world that's we have a society where everybody seems to be it, collectively present. You know, there's exceptions, of course, uh, yep. but collectively we're scared of our own shadows. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. So how how does letters to the river fit into all of this? Well, letters to the river. I mean that book. Was, uh, that book was about really how to, in some sense, how to create a heroic journey out of your life, you know, and, and it's kind of, it, it's about some of the issues that we have to face. And so, um, and so that was a book about nine big core issues, you know, it's just a, one is uh, our relationship between the known and the unknown. We always want to stay in the known and avoid mm. the unknown because mm. the unknown brings up fear. So, so that book was all about how to take a journey into the unknown, and certainly a lot of the the teachings of that book was based on my work leading Vision Quest, which is at its core a heroic journey and a kind of in a in a very major way a facing the unknown, not just the unknown in the world, but the unknown in your in yourself. So, what exactly um, is a what exactly is a Vision Quest? Well. Uh, I guess in a way to make it uh, understand more understandable to your viewers, I, there are three core elements of a vision quest. When it, so it's usually a time where you go out into nature, into wilderness. And so in the way I lead it, it's four days and nights. You're in wilderness. You're alone. You don't bring any things like books or entertainment or smartphones. So you're in wilderness. You're alone. And you're fasting. No food. So, and... And, you know, the people are going to immediately have a response to that. But what I would say to make it more understandable is Christ uh, went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days. Buddha walked into the, the forest in 500 B.C. and fasted under the Bodhi tree. Moses climbed to the top of Mount Sinai and fasted, you know, to speak to God. Mohammed went into a cave and fasted, and that was the start of Islam. It's this kind of core archetypal mm. process that's been done since human beings were human beings, where you have to deeply have an encounter with, on the one hand, we could call it the outer world, nature, which created us, but also have a deep encounter with our inner world and all that we project onto nature. Because when we're out there and alone and in nature with no distractions, it's essentially we meet ourselves in ways that we virtually never do when we're in social life and constantly talking and, um, and coming back to our, our our egos and our our status and our um, personality. So, is this so something a, you do? You teach people? You do one on one with people, or you do it with? How do you like? What is the logistics of it exactly? I do it in small groups. So you know, it's um, eight would be the maximum, but the groups are usually about six. And it's an 11 day program. So there's first there's um, three and a half days of preparation, a lot of teachings, not just teachings about the physical plane parts of it, like what to expect from fasting and what are the animals you might need in this or that wilderness, but also about diff- different rituals or practices that get you deeply in touch with your core feelings and longings and desires. So there's three and a half days of that. And then there's the four day and, and night solo fasting in wilderness. And then, mm. and then after that, there's uh, three days, which are really going into the story of what happened to you. What, what did you encounter in terms of animals? What were your dreams? What insights did you have? And there's, there's a lot of process of how to integrate that and then bring it back into the life you left behind and, and plant it so it'll grow there. Let me just understand this. That fourth, that middle period is four days by yourself, no food, and no no con- no human contact. You're completely alone. Yep. Yeah, you have water, but no food. You're totally alone. Yeah. Huh. Uh, what do people experience? Like, what's the general consensus, or is there a general consensus after that? Well, I mean, people come for different intentions, but, but a, a lot, you know, one of the core intentions is that some people come with is, I want to find my purpose in life, why I'm here, what I really want, not what, not what my parents or my educational mm. system, 
what the culture said I should want. What do I really want out of life? So some people come to really find their purpose and what they're here for. Some people come because they want to put an end. To, it's called a rite of passage. They want to put an end to one part of their life and mm. move into the next phase. And those could be external ends, like I've been divorced now for a year and a half, but I haven't moved on. So they want to make a ritual final ending yeah. of that previous relationship. Or it could be for internal reasons. I've lived, I, I've lived my whole life as a victim, or I've lived my whole life just trying to please other people, and I don't want to live that way anymore. So. Okay, so we, we got about a minute now. How do people get a hold of you if people are interested? What do they need to do? Okay, it's a, anybody can do this, I assume. And what's the cost, by the way? Uh, the cost is twelve ninety five. And then have people just email you? Well, the best way would actually go on the website www.quest4vision, all lowercase, and that's F O R Quest Four Vision dot com, and it'll give a description of all the various programs, the schedule. It'll have contact, so people can click on that and send me an email. So awesome. that would be thank you also, thank you so spare spare we're out of time buddy i appreciate it but okay. thank you so much the book is the vision quest a guides training and also lessons to the river if you're interested in more information go to questforvision.com thanks sparrow we'll talk to you again buddy hey. that was but sparrow okay. Hart, and that bye-bye and that's all the time we have for today thanks for listening to the bright side friends i am pharmacist ben have a wonderful beautiful awesome spectacular day we'll talk to you all later folks bye for now